good afternoon to everyone. And I am uh, Laura Morales, and I am a professor of comparative politics at uh, Sciences Po in, in Paris. And this third and, and last session will focus on four very interesting papers um, that demonstrate uh, the specific tools that they've developed um, to process and to analyze the rich parliamentary corpora. The first uh, paper by Navarreta and, um, and Hansen um, uses corpora from uh, party manifestos and parliamentary speeches in Denmark uh, to produce predictive uh, models of the party identity or membership of the speech producers. The second uh, paper by Hoffman and colleagues uh, focuses on tools uh, to compare lexical usage about uh, political issues linked to political parties in media and parliamentary diachronic corpora from Austria. The third paper by Blätte and colleagues uh, focuses on tools to process and analyze with topic models uh, parliamentary debates uh, in four European countries um, and to determine the extent to which uh, these debates um, on migration have become Europeanized. And finally, the fourth paper by Diwersi and uh, Luxardo focuses on debates in the French uh, lower chamber to illustrate how a new annotated uh, corpus can be used to analyze the lexical usage of parliamentarians in debates around two specific pieces of legislation. So um, these are all very exciting papers and I sincerely recommend that you read them all. Um, in the slides that uh, will come next after this one, um, there are specific elements of feedback for each of the papers. But in the sake of time, I will not focus on those, feed, uh, those pieces of feedback and I will just focus exclusively on, on questions to, to the authors. So first, I would like to start uh, with general questions for all papers. Um, and these are um, first relating uh, to, to the ambition of the paper. So uh, most papers uh, remain at the very descriptive level. And I was wondering um, if each of the paper uh, givers could uh, reflect on how speech patterns can be identified and, um, uh, and how uh, lexical and topic occurrences can be properly analyzed. This is what they all do. And obviously description is essential, but um, I would like them to address how are these tools useful to gain explanatory insights into political speech. So uh, how the tools can allow us to go a little bit further. Um, the second generic question uh, um, is uh, relating uh, specifically on how the methods can uh, help us understand the substantive political dynamics. So we already know that uh, different parties prioritize different topics and issues while still retaining some uh, core common or sometimes balance uh, issues and, and topics. And we already know from political science that when the context changes, parties will adapt the topics and, and issues that they focus. So how can these tools allow us to understand uh, uh, that the why, how and when uh, those changes are triggered and, and how can they help us understand the substantive political dynamics that underlie a speed change. These generic questions might be better answered perhaps focusing on each of the areas of interest of, of each of the papers. So for example, um, in the paper by Navarreta and Hansen, it would be useful to perhaps uh, tell us a little bit about um, uh, so that we can understand how does the predictive uh, model help us understand further the political uses of language given that we don't really need to predict the parties of the speakers or texts because we, we already know them. And um, in the paper by Hoffman and colleagues, it would be useful to understand how media bias affects uh, the lexical analysis. So, so what are the results telling us about the issues or the topics that parties are, are linked to? In the paper by Blette and colleagues, it would be uh, very interesting to understand uh, what may be the next steps after the description of co-occurrence of migration and, and European topics. And um, finally, perhaps in the paper by Diwarsi and Luxardo, um, it would be uh, useful uh, to understand uh, also how can the lexical analysis help us explain or account for, for example, behaviors in parliament. So uh, thanks for listening. And uh, now each of the papers will have uh, five minutes to react to the general and or specific questions as they wish. Thank you. So the first uh, one will be uh, Navarreta and uh, Hansen. I'm not sure which of the two will be presenting. It's me, Navarreta. And uh, I'm Navarreta, Constanza Navarreta. And I am speaking from Copenhagen. OK. Your uh, first question uh, is uh, completely 
correct uh, that we only look uh, at whether there are uh, the degree of uh, uniqueness uh, uh, versus uh, differences in manifesto that we do manually and then in parliamentary speeches uh, that we do automatically. I want to explain why we have this study and uh, how it can be generalized. We know gener generally the parties have both commonalities uh, and uh, differences when they speak, but uh, we believe that different parties uh, and left and right wing in different countries uh, change their uh, relation uh, over time uh, and also because of the different cultures. And in Denmark, uh, the past 20 years, uh, the differences between uh, what we call the historical parties, so traditional liberal parties, social democratic, and so on, have been uh, uh, diminishing. So that people, voters, uh, often ask why we should stay in this party, and they change from one party to the other. On the other side, there have, have come new parties that gain or are gaining popularity, advocating a few topics, reducing non-Western immigration, decreasing taxes, improving the environment, and so on. So, other parties, both traditional and new party, take the ownership of the different uh, topics uh, in order to get uh, more votes. New slide, please. So, what we can ask by looking uh, at uh, the extent of this uh, similarity is whether it makes sense in some countries uh, or in all countries to have uh, this traditional uh, dichotomy between the left and right wings or if we should look at different subjects and the parties change left and right depending on the topic. So how our study can be generalized. First of all, we could look at the same, doing the same prediction. We looked at the past 10 years, but we could do the same in different spans of time. Then we could add the topic uh, the subject, uh, and just uh, look, uh, for example, environment uh, or uh, foreign uh, politics uh, and see how the different uh, parties become more similar or more different. We have some of this data. The other thing we could, uh, in our paper with uh, Will, uh, we have chosen not only to look uh, at uh, 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 members of the parliament uh, that were not uh, uh, ministers at the same time, but we have the impressions that when uh, uh, people get in the uh, uh, in the government, they become near because uh, they become all uh, uh, they don't keep the same uh, hard uh, hardest lines that they have, for example, uh, in the manifestos. So it's also something noted by Paula. And then you could do the same study uh, in different countries uh, and see whether there is the same uh, movement between the left and right uh, or not being this uh, division. As it is, uh, for example, uh, in the States, there is still uh, the Democrats and the Republicans. And then uh, I think we have an interest uh, in the uh, in the in analyzing this data from a computational linguistic point of view, because they are not like all other data. The Danish answer, as many other answers, are corrected transcripts of speech. That is, they are not a written language, they are not spoken language. Uh, we can't uh, uh, distinguish uh, uh, the different people uh, uh, because of, for example, uh, poses uh, or uh, fillers. But uh, uh, and also the interesting thing, I think, in our study is that uh, we have uh, used uh, also portions of speeches that are quite uh, small. Uh, we have removed uh, the speeches that are under seven uh, words, but some of the speeches are ten words. It's still interesting that you can partly identify them in many cases. 
So, uh, and I think that developing uh, uh, tools uh, just uh, for political speeches will also improve democracy because uh, at some point uh, you could test uh, that party they say in their manifesto or uh, that they are uh, liberal for what uh, respect to some aspect and then uh, when they are in the parliament uh, this is something completely different so i'm finished okay thank you very much so we will uh, move on to the next uh, uh, reaction uh, the paper uh, by hoffman and colleagues i think uh, tanya visik uh, looks like she's going to be presenting. Yeah, thank you. Um, so this paper was written in the context of the Dillon project funded by the Go Digital Call from the Austrian Academy of Sciences. And in general, in this project, we are looking at uh, language change in the last 20 years in Austrian German and which role a politician plays in terms of lexical innovation. So if they are lexical innovators. So this uh, study reported here in the paper is only a pilot study. Um, in the, this um, paper, we actually didn't focus so much on the methods and uh, the description of the method, but more on the results and the insights that this uh, analysis gave us in terms of about political speech and about politics. So we looked at lexical stability per party, similarities between parties, and lexical similarity across corpora. And our results point to interesting trends that relate to patterns in political speech of parties in a coalition versus parties in the opposition. So on one hand, parties in a coalition tend to converge onto similar lexical choices, while opposing parties diverge in terms of their lexical choices. So these are the two patterns we found out by the uh, responding to the first question, lexical stability per party and similarities between parties. And furthermore, by combining two different corpora, so the Austrian media corpus with newspaper articles and the uh, um, political speeches delivered in the Austrian parliament, we found out that different parties have varying levels of success in getting their parliamentary lexical repertoire picked up by the media. So these are also topics that uh, are treated in studies regarding mediatization of political communication. But in most of these studies, um, small amount of made, uh, data is processed. And our approach is uh, able to look at um, bigger amount of data. And our um, preliminary results are um, a starting point that uh, we could think that it's interesting to do um, contrastive study analysis with uh, the data of other countries, as uh, the previous speaker also mentioned. Regarding the second uh, question, um, is that um, with our approach, this uh, diachronic time series approach, um, we can um, theoretically correlate lexical usage with any potential extralinguistic event and check the correlation. So with our approach, uh, we don't have to choose what we looked at in, the, uh, in this paper, if there's a correlation between if the parties in, a, in the opposition or in, in the government, but we could look at different variables with this uh, time series uh, approach. And for the third question that is specific to our, our paper, so if the media bias is affecting our analysis, um, we have to say we haven't checked this yet because we are, uh, as it was mentioned, it's only a pilot study. Um, on one hand, the Austrian media corpus we are using for the analysis is a very big corpus and it's very balanced because it really um, 
um, has all the media types, official media types uh, of the Austrian media landscape. So on, uh, on, uh, on national level, on regional level. However, um, specific online outlets, uh, especially for the far right wing or the far left wing, is not in the corpus and also social media is not in the corpus. So um, for the first thing we sh should um, see if our results are affected um, by a media bias, by um, creating subcorpora and checking if uh, our results change regarding the type of media we are having in this subcorpora. And the second approach would be to extend the corpus also to other online media outlets such as um, uh, online publications from uh, far right wing or far left wing um, political parties, as well as social media. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Tanya. Uh, we'll move to the next uh, paper, uh, which I assume uh, may be presented by Andreas Plette. Hello, with a strong of support of Joanna. Um, but first of all, I, I, I thought I'd answer that question a lot that you didn't ask, but uh, Jan did, uh, which is uh, how can we access the corpora? Uh, and I just copied a, a few uh, persistent identifiers into the chat so that you can see where you could work with the four corpora we, uh, we have worked with, uh, Jamapal, Ostupal, Paripal, and uh, uh, the three, the three corpus is not yet there. Um, and we should have a discussion maybe where we want to have our corpora at the end of the day. We use uh, Cenodo as a Dropbox, but it's not the perfect solution, certainly from a cladding point of view, and that doesn't come with any quality control. And so, but that's something different. Uh, thanks, Laura, so much for the, uh, for the questions you had and the comments. Um, so the big question you had is what's, what are we up to yet uh, or next? Um, now, uh, our point of departure was that good description is better than bad explanation. And often description, uh, sound description is difficult enough when you work with the big data that we have here. One of the favorites is the, the histogram of the length of speeches in the four parliaments. On the, it's on the next slide, but what you can gather from it easily uh, is that parliamentary cultures are very different, that there's uh, a, a recognizable similarity of the standard length of speeches in Austria and Germany, but there's so much more short speeches uh, in the Netherlands and, uh, and in, uh, in France and the uh, Assemblée Nationale. Um, so there's we, we discover something if we are good at description, but you're perfectly right. Um, what should we do next? Uh, first, um, we uh, shouldn't, we should stop considering the whole parliament and move to the level of parties or parliamentary groups. And it would be interesting, and it will be interesting to see which party starts with which kind of of raising attention for uh, migration in a Europeanized context in which parties follow. Uh, we, in the context of popular, or the discourse on populism, we have talked about the contagion effect quite a bit. And do we see, see that uh, in the European Parliament? Um, and if we proceed that way, uh, we should also introduce more substantive concepts. Uh, we were very parsimonious in this first take, we just used the notion of attention from the comparative agendas project, but we should use, move on to frames and narratives. Uh, then second, or third, um, we were purely data-driven in this paper. Uh, and uh, actually, as a group, we don't believe that a pure data-driven uh, approach is plausible for linguistic data, for text because it, this is about meaning and interpretation and there are so much we may miss if we just count words and uh, apply algorithms. So what we really want to do is um, to combine the quantitative analysis with um, hand coded uh, or hand coding uh, parts of uh, the corpus and then move on to machine learning and to share ideas how we could do that. 
I put two links into uh, the slides that refer to a Flex dashboard that you can use to interactively explore uh, topic models. Um, and then uh, we have, uh, we, we like the idea of quantification, which is to combine quantity and quality. And we have quite a few concepts, uh, tools to proceed that way. This is top, top left. This is the histogram I just talked about with the, the oddity of the length of speeches in the different parliaments. And we need to be careful what is a speech actually, but that's another debate. And uh, top right, you have kind of the final or the, the main result, which is that uh, we have a Europeanization of migration debates in France and uh, in um, the smaller EU member states, the Netherlands and uh, uh, Austria, hello, hello. and the decline of Europeanization in Germany. Hello, hello. And you were perfectly right on your remarks. Hello. We were not perfect, or we stumbled over into perfect uh, So this is uh, not a decline of Europeanization, but a persistent high level, actually. Now, um, what are potential explanations that we might pursue? Um, smaller member states might be more, might feel interdependence or vulnerability uh, stronger than bigger states. Um, and uh, I already touched the effects of populist parties. Uh, but again, we do not know until we really look into the data. And I think this is one of the important next steps is to really move forward with the quantitative, qualitative uh, analysis of data. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Uh, that was really useful. Uh, so let's move to the last um, uh, set of comments and reactions uh, by Sasha Diwersi and Giancarlo Luxardo. I don't know who of the two will be presenting. <clears throat> yes, this is uh, Giancarlo Luxardo speaking. So I will start and then uh, Sasha will continue. Um, I hope that our answers um, uh, will answer the, our specific question, but also the general questions. So um, the first question was about uh, exploratory analysis. Um, and uh, the answer is that uh, our paper as a primarily a demonstrative purpose. Um, that is, um, we feel that uh, our paper uh, could be relevant to the three topics that we have seen today, corpus, uh, tools, and analysis. So we don't pretend to have uh, a deep analysis from the political point of view. Um, our area is uh, textometry, which is uh, exploratory multidimensional analysis. That is, we use um, statistical methods uh, in order to analyze our corpus. And uh, we hope we can give insights um, working uh, both uh, at the political level which is the domain of our corpus, but also at the linguistic level. And uh, we are coming from a linguistic lab, so this is our domain. Um, uh, so we have uh, processed here uh, uh, specific legislation, legislation uh, the loi travail, uh, we worked with uh, uh, with um, standard uh, query language, which is the one from the Corpus Query Processor, and uh, with the common tools for text analysis, uh, mainly in uh, the R environment. So first, uh, we may move to the next uh, two slides to see the results of our correspondence analysis. So we made a cross tabulation based on uh, lemmas and uh, political affiliations. Uh, the first dimension of the correspondence analysis shows an unexpected opposition between ecologists and socialists, which is focused around the topic of uh, the demonstrations. 
cold, uh, nuit debout, which were these uh, street meetings in, in the night. And we have also a, a second dimension, which is built uh, by the opposition uh, to this law, uh, which is shown by the left uh, parties. Uh, and this opposition is uh, mainly based by arguments about social consequences uh, of these laws. We see words in French like pauvreté, temps partiel, salaire, and so on here in the bottom of um, the plot. And uh, we also find words about the European treaties. Uh, Sasha, can you continue? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Just to see the microphone. So um, we should go, go back perhaps to the, uh, the first slide with the, the answers to the questions. Um, I just will um, perhaps um, uh, develop a bit the idea of the explanations you can give uh, above the um, uh, observed op opposition, because this is uh, what uh, our analysis is about in the first time. It's just to show uh, oppositions in a, in a discursive field, if you, if you like. So um, the, the question is, um, what will this say about the position of the of the ecologists uh, with respect to the Socialist Party, for perhaps, but also I will link this to the second question uh, of, of the coherence of, of the discourse uh, by the groups, by different parliamentary groups. Um, the first observation you can have, um, perhaps, it's that you can have effects that are based on the, on the size of the parliamentary groups and perhaps that if there are uh, positions that are less coherent, um, this group will perhaps also emerge as uh, defining one opposition and uh, have a specific outlier position in, in this kind of experiment uh, we showed. The second question is, um, could you go back perhaps to the slides before? <laughs> Just have to see the answers we give well. Um, it's, um, the question is also the, how, how you can measure perhaps, and this was the question which we were asked, uh, coherence uh, and variance inside one parliamentary group. I think uh, there are two answers to this. Um, what we wanted to do in our paper in the first time, as uh, this has been said by Giancarlo, uh, was that we uh, wanted to show how textometry would address this kind of corpus. You should know that political analysis and textometry is something that is very traditional since the 60s, 70s. But a lot of work on political discourse in France was a discourse on, on, uh, on trade unions, of trade unions, or uh, in the last years by the work of Damo Mayat, a work on, the, uh, on uh, presidential discourse. But you have, you have not much work in textometric uh, tradition on parliamentary discourse. This is very interesting, but I think it's perhaps due to the nature of parliamentary discourse. I, I will say something like that at the end of this. Uh, the second um, question was, so how can we analyze this within a framework that is known in textometry? The only thing we can do in, the, in this uh, rather uh, tight uh, methodological framework is to differentiate the variables so you can uh, perhaps work rather on the on the different speakers, show uh, if there are oppositions and groups of speakers which emerge, and then uh, uh, di uh, divulge in the second step their, um, their pertinence to one uh, parliamentary group. So perhaps to see if speakers uh, um, go together, form oppositional blocks with other speakers, uh, uh, despite of their uh, parliamentary uh, pertinence. The second uh, um, um, approach would perhaps be something which is about, above the framework of textometrics, so the classical framework of textometrics, 
would rather be perhaps working with uh, machine learning techniques and uh, um, taking uh, the ontology of parliamentary groups as perhaps class classification variable and then see the quality of the, class the classification in some sense to see if the variable of parliamentary group is something that gives very uh, coherent categories. So this could be perhaps one way to go above the framework of textometrics and, and use other approaches. Just let me finish perhaps <coughs> on the question of, of the coherence of the discourse in parliament uh, um, as such. The question has already been addressed and it has been said, okay, uh, parliamentary discourse is a discourse genre which is very diverse. Uh, with respect to other genres, it's rather spoken, but spoken language, but prepared spoken language, so it's not... Uh, uh, but I think what you can observe uh, in parliamentary data is that, okay, it's a macro genre, perhaps, but inside the parliamentary discourse, you have also different genres. You can take, for example, uh, the, what, is, uh, what is said by the presidency of the parliament. This is very different discourse. Mm -hmm. Uh, as if you have, for example, in the, in the French tradition of questions to the government, this is also a discourse genre. You have the debates uh, around uh, the, the budget. I think also this is not the same difference genre. So we have a very heteroclit um, uh, databases at the end from the genre side. So this is also something you should work on. We should work on. And I, what I see in the French data what is very interesting, as, had, uh, as it uh, is uh, uh, distributed by the parliamentary service in France since uh, two, uh, 2014, is that you can have access to uh, indications of the type of debate or type of intervention. So this could be a, a variable that could be exploited also to see the generic variety of parliamentary debates. So okay, this thank you. I think we need to be leaving it there because uh, we're running a little bit uh, uh, out of time. Mm -hmm.